Thank you. Dinta. Esti barbaguya Michigan nesta. My family numenuk at a. Dutlan numenuk a gurista. Little bit denek a gurista. Ladies as bats. Tachon denek a rustigisi. So first, thank you so much for inviting me today. Um, I just told you my name, <laughs> where I'm from, Michigan, right, where I live right now. My family is Comanche, but we don't speak Comanche. Uh, I do speak a little bit of Casca, which is what I just spoke, um, and I hope to understand more. Um, I want to start first by also thanking and acknowledging all of the people and places that have made this possible. Often in traditional academic style talks, we put off our thanks to the very end, and often it gets shunted aside. So I'm going to start first by saying again how much of an honor it is to be speaking here today, welcomed by the University of British Columbia community and faculty and students and everyone. It's been especially rewarding. I'm also grateful to the Musqueam Nation for being the first stewards taking care of this beautiful land and sharing this responsibility with the university today. And I also have many more people to thank in this next slide. There are just a few images here of all of the elders and some of the graduate students from UBC and Patrick Moore um, who have made this possible. And I would also just like to point out very quickly an elder who passed away and so in part this, this talk, excuse me, <clears throat> is uh, in honor of Eileen Van Bipper and all that she has brought to um, learning Casca and un beginning to understand what it means to be Casca. So, sugo sunla. Okay, in this next slide, um, it's just to orient us. Uh, being from the States, teaching at the University of Michigan, a lot of my students and faculty don't know where the Yukon is. <laughs> they know Alaska, so it's okay. <laughs> um, so, as Pat was mentioning, um, the traditional territory for the Casca First Nations is sort of south along the border between the Yukon Territory and British Columbia and spills over. But Watson Lake, if, you ever, have you, if you've ever driven up the Alaska-Canada Highway, Watson Lake is the first community town in the Yukon Territory that will greet you, and it greets you with the signpost forest. <clears throat> okay, so that's part of what, where we will be today. The other place that we will be today, which I don't have a map of, is Oklahoma and Warm Springs. And so Oklahoma is just north of Texas. I'm sure you all know where Texas is. Um, and Warm Springs is a reservation located in Oregon, so just a little south of here. Okay, I want to begin with a quote from Del Himes. So he was a scholar who was crucial to defining the academic discipline that I associate with, linguistic anthropology. He was also a vigilant advocate for First Nations and other minority groups' rights and freedoms. And he spent much of his life working at the Warm Springs Reservation, documenting and recording Aboriginal speakers, their narratives, their life. So in this quote, which I'll read to you, he says, one way to think about a society is in terms of the voices it has and might have. And so I read this now as, as a suggestion, an indication that there is a future, right? If we are soci a society who values Aboriginal languages, then they just might have a future. Okay, so throughout the rest of this talk, I'm going to reflect on the various efforts that have been imagined and implemented in order to predict and project a future for Aboriginal languages. Okay, moving on. 
in this next slide. <laughs> Anyone recognize these instruments? <laughs> I suppose the earliest documentarians of Aboriginal languages could not have imagined that many of the languages they were writing down in journals, in letters to magistrates, in field notes, and so forth, would still be around in the 21st century. Languages like Dene, Anishinaabe Muen, Numunu, Maliseet, Washko, Sahaptin, Musqueam, and so forth. Nor were they likely to have imagined that their records would be used to recreate a language as in the case of Wampanoag and Jesse Little Doe's efforts, or in the case of Miamia Mia language renewal, which you heard about last week with, from Daryl Baldwin, or individuals in the here and now. Right? Individuals are critical to creating a future for these languages. Similarly, where there are very few speakers, it can take just one person to change a language's outcome. So Rosalie Bethel's efforts to revitalize Western Mono and provide materials for future speakers is just one example. Even though the CD-ROM on which the stories and lessons were captured in the early 2000s has become an obsolete technology, an obsolete, a techno remnant, right? If you want to go to the next slide. Removing it from circulation, but new technologies now, right, can accommodate the transfer of its contents and thus renew its circulation and Western Mono's future, at least as a sound file. So the early documentarians, like the purveyors of popular language endangerment rhetoric today, talked about indigenous languages as if they had a shelf life, a short shelf life. They were to expire before all other languages. We have been waiting for that expiration date for some time now. But even in our century-long wait, the expectation remains. These endangered languages are going to die. Two assumptions underscore this well-discoursed and widely held expectation. The first is that we can cleanly and discreetly identify individual endangered languages. And the second is that there really is nothing we can do to alter their demise beyond recording them and raising awareness. Of course, right, ironically, it is this discourse of death that has kept many languages alive. Okay, so today, part of our current intervention is to expand our view of both what a language is and what it means to survive into the future, to even have a future. There's already incredible work being done to renew and revitalize indigenous language communities, such as right here in Vancouver and British Columbia, with language classes offered at the universities, to immersion programs, in First Nations run schools to individual and family efforts to reclaim their heritage languages in the home. But those involved and their efforts often appeal to specialized audiences who are already committed to carrying out these languages into the future. Similarly, the particular collaborations between linguists and First Nations or across institutions like band governments and universities recognize the need to work together to build a linguistic future for particular languages. Yet even among these specialist and well-intentioned institutions, particular ideas, what we call in academia, right, ideologies of language, right, ideas about what should be documented, how should it be documented, who should be documenting, who should be documented, right, ideologies of development, so styles of pedagogy, what kinds of uses, the languages will have, what kinds of applications, so ideas of utility, and then ideologies of progress, ideas about evaluation, about results, and about outcomes. All of these exist together, underlying a lot of this work. So rather than just privileging the academic specialized viewpoints and elite, elite audiences, the recognition of a future or, a possible fut or possible futures for indigenous languages requires recognizing different and new perspectives and different and new audiences. Okay, so let's begin with the question, what is an endangered language? So I'm sure many of you in this audience are familiar with these kinds of images and these kinds of statements. Right, my family, who I will talk about sh shortly, Right, is aware of this, even if they're not aware of particular languages and their situations. 
So my adorable nephew, a kindergartner, told me when I asked him this question, though he might have been, oh, I don't know, helped by his parents before we spoke. <laughs> my adorable nephew said, an endangered language is a language that people don't speak anymore. While I doubt kindergartners have heated debates over what constitutes endangerment of any kind, let alone languages, it has become a concept that even young children are being socialized to use and understand. Many of my colleagues, such as Robert Moore, Jane Hill, Monica Heller, Shaley Millman, who may be in the audience or not, <laughs> right, have analyzed the popular and academic discourses that project an end, that predict no living future for endangered languages. Right? It's a discourse that suggests that they're not entitled to a future beyond the text, beyond the academic record. And while I have worked on, around, and through this question in my own research, I have never really fully interrogated this phrase. Right? I've never asked non-specialists, non-language advocates, or non-invested individuals what they think an endangered language is. So, as a result, and as long as hopefully you'll bear with me, right, I have become very curious um, about what non-academics and non-advocates think. So to begin to gauge how interesting and important a subject this might be, I decided to ask my family what they think. So I conducted a very brief survey over email, asking them first what they considered an endangered language to be, and then I asked them what the future of an endangered language might look like. Okay, so you can see how they responded, but I'm going to give you a little more information about my subject pool. So, in some ways, my family is not a representative sample of some generic non-specialist public, right? We're Comanche. The older generations and some of my cousins grew up on tribal land, either in Oklahoma or on the Warm Springs Reservation in Oregon. None of us speak Comanche. My grandfather was probably the last speaker of Comanche in our family, and even then there is some question about his knowledge of the language. One of my uncles speaks a little Sahaptan, though he'd probably deny this, and one of my aunts studied Comanche briefly. And when I moved myself to the Southwest, I stumbled across a Comanche grammar and dictionary. And of course, one of the, my first reactions here was like, how am I going to understand this? Now I need a degree in linguistics. <laughs> Right? And I tried self-study, but without much success. So given our background and my job, right, you might think our awareness of indigenous language endangerment might be more informed than that of the general populace, and therefore not representative. Perhaps. On the other hand, they might be the ideal group of people to ask because of our Indian heritage and our different investments in and relationships to our heritage language. Okay, so I sent this out. My mother also helped me circulate this. And of all of my relatives, only nine responded. <laughs> Not bad. <laughs> right, and as you can see here, the majority of them agreed that an endangered language is one with only a few speakers left. Though, one of my aunts said, it's really more about if there's generational, intergenerational transmission, right? Are younger people learning this? And then the few that disagreed decided to quibble over the meaning of few, right? So no, it's more than a few. It could be a few thousand. It could be any population at risk. And that's actually quite insightful in some ways for a non-specialist in a family that's not busy trying to revitalize their own heritage language. Okay, so after this, I followed up and asked them what they thought the future then of these languages with few speakers or no speakers left would be. And as you might predict, they said things like disappear, death, extinction, bleak, bleak but not extinct because of recordings and texts. One person said, it meant no more first language speakers, right? So finally, someone started breaking up the categories. They started marking categories. They started distinguishing between first and second, and spoken and not spoken. 
And then one person even made a distinction between dead, which she took to mean as no longer spoken in the home, and extinct, no longer spoken anywhere. And then finally, two other people noted the parallelism right between endangered species and endangered languages. Okay, so all of these responses project a future for indigenous endangered languages where they are, they are no longer taught, they are no longer learned, they are no longer spoken. Right, like the prognostications of the early Americanists and North American governments, language death seems imminent for endangered languages, where the only recourse remaining for their existence is preservation in texts, in recordings, and on the internet. Of course, these sentiments are emanating from a group of people who no longer know their heritage language and have limited access to it. So what about situations where the endangered language is still accessible every day and where it is still a first language for some? Right? The future might look different in this case. Okay, so luckily we have just such a case. When I began doing research and collaborating on Aboriginal language projects in the Yukon Territory in 1998, the discourse of the government and other institutions emphasized the growing decline in Aboriginal language use and first language acquisition. So reports and surveys like these underscored the overall drop in numbers, right? And programs and people were developing resources for teaching and training Aboriginal language teachers, along with continuing to document the languages. My research interest at the time was narrowly focused on first language acquisition and socialization, uh, in part because one of the things that inspired me to start thinking about acquisition was because the Comanche Nation at the time had maybe eight fluent first language speakers left, right? And so a lot of work was going into second language acquisition. But there was still, right, the question remained, how do kids go about acquiring these languages? So it was possible that if you could study where kids were still learning the language, you could get a better idea about how to create a pedagogy and a curriculum that would facilitate that. Okay, so I quickly came to realize two things. Right? Very few, if any, children were, lear were learning these languages as, I'm going to say this, as fully productive and exclusive first languages. Right? So they're in multilingual households. And there was far more to understanding an endangered language situation than sketching the grammar and recording oral narratives. Now, of course, trained as a linguistic anthropologist, I kind of already took that for granted. But as uh, any academic or future academic knows, part of your training involves applying for funding. And often, when you're working in an endangered language community, funders want to see you emphasize the documentation part of things and the grammar part of things. They're, at the time, they were not so interested in the speaking part. So people in communities where adults and elders were still speaking the language um, in familiar contexts, had started to become aware of a decline in knowledge among younger generations. So this was what was starting to happen uh, when I was beginning to work up there. And this, but this awareness right, was mediated by social expectations and knowledge about an individual's personal life. So one of the things I came to, under, to realize very clearly right, is that when people were, would evaluate someone as being a good speaker or a less good speaker or as someone who doesn't understand or someone who does understand, part of what was coming into play in those assessments right, was, this, um, was their familiarity with the person's or the child's family history. So just very briefly, I know transcripts, especially in black and white, are not the most exciting thing. <laughs> But the, so this was taken from a publication. And you, you can see in this interaction, it's at an Aboriginal head start. So you have two elders and you have a young child. I, she's around five at the time. And they're trying to get her to come and join in on the activity, right? So we have an elder who came into the Aboriginal head start that day and she was going to talk to the kids about sewing. <clears throat> And they're trying to get her attention. They're saying, Ani, Adintik, right? And eventually, they decide the child doesn't really understand what they're saying to her. And 
they, try, they start commenting on why they think the child doesn't understand. And part of what they attribute this to is the, the linguistic variety being spoken in her home for environment as being something that is preventing her from understanding their way of speaking. And so it's becoming attached right, to the family situation and style of speech. OK. So awareness also varied generationally. Younger generations, adolescents, for example, assumed that they would begin to use and speak an Aboriginal language like their parents and grandparents as they themselves got older. Children's associations of Aboriginal language use with grandparents emerged early on in their conceptualizations of their sociolinguistic environments, in fact. Okay, adolescents also understood the different patterns of Aboriginal language use in relation to status differences mediated by age and kinship. So the speaking of an Aboriginal language was shifting from being associated with childhood to being associated with adulthood. And their expectation of late acquisition, right, reframed the pattern of language endangerment as a pattern of social development. So this is actually not unusual. We're going to return to my nephew, the kindergartner, who similarly views language, endangered or otherwise, as related to kinship. So while the most important language to him at this moment is English, he also considered his parents' languages important. I mean, of course, to get him to finally talk about this, we had to talk about his Pokemon collection. But we eventually got there. <laughs> and when I pressed him about what languages he would consider important to learn, he identified his mother's heritage language, Norwegian, and one of his father's, German, because, he said, they were the languages of his parents. He identified them with his parents, right? So this suggests that my nephew, like these young kids at the Aboriginal Head Start, was directly tying his own linguistic identity to the associations his parents made. And they weren't associations with his neighborhood, or with his grandparents, or his cousins, or his in-laws. I mean, he, you might think, right, he's growing up in the States, it's a very monolingual environment. But sort of the upper middle class parents, like my, his family, right, they are emphasizing multilingualism. So he had been in a Spanish immersion preschool, right, his, his aunts on his mother's side was a first language Spanish speaker from Mexico. He had neighborhood friends who spoke other languages. So he could have identified with those languages, right? The other thing about this is that it didn't depend on any actual linguistic practice, right? It was his mother. His mother doesn't speak any Norwegian. Um, but for him, that was a crucial language. That was something he really was looking, uh, emblematizing in his way, right? It was something, it was part of his identity. OK, so older adults, adults and elders also show a greater awareness of and often attribute more significance to heritage languages um, in, in not necessarily an identical way to young children, right? but there's also a discussion of identification. And they tend to place more significance than younger, midlife, mid-career individuals might. So together, right, these cases suggest that our relationship to heritage languages change in relation to our lifespan or our life cycle, right, fading in and out of awareness and significance in relation to our moments in life. And secondly, the kinds of futures imaginable for endangered indigenous heritage languages or any language, right, will be in relation, I'm going to suggest this and come back to it, will be in relation to the practices, the social and technological practices of those generations who are most concerned. Okay. Another question that we often ask is, what does it mean to save a language? Or more exactly, how can we save a language? Again, this is often a question posed among the very specialized population of language advocates um, and scholars. Entire books have been written about this, <coughs> such as Grenoble and Whaley's Saving Languages, Claire Brown's Field Methods text talks about how to do this, um, Hinton's work, which you're familiar with. Right, all of this, what they often point out now is that what saving means depends on the social, cultural, and ideological circumstances surrounding the endangered language. 
Now, one approach that much of the current li literature also stresses is collaboration between indigenous communities and academic institutions, and between language advocates and linguists or anthropologists. So Dr. Gus Palmer, who's a Kiowa professor at the University of Oklahoma, makes this argument elegantly by analogy with a Kiowa narrative. So I'm not going to tell the narrative, <laughs> but it's the story of the legend of the star girls. So some of you might be familiar with this. And in his version, it's, it starts, there are children, they're playing, and they want to, they want one, someone to take on the role of the bear. Now part of this, right, is, prob is a challenge because it's, it's even taboo to say the word bear. But eventually they get one of the older girls to take on this role and start chasing them. And they're ch she's chasing the kids all over and she starts to transform. And so then the other young children are scared and a rock calls to them, this rock, and tells them to climb on. And so they do eventually. And they are saved because the rock grows, becomes animate, and the bear can't reach them. Okay, so in part, this is a narrative about the creation of Devil Sour in Wyoming. But more importantly, it is a narrative about recognizing the agency in all things, a rock in this case, and anything's potential to transform the landscape, to transform the linguistic landscape for us. While institutions and linguists might be the rock that became Devil's Tower, saving the children from the bear, one of Palmer's points is that we shouldn't overlook the rock. It just might save us. The First Nations in the Yukon Territory don't seem to have had trouble recognizing the rock or the potential of rocks, right? In fact, one of the reasons that I ended up in the Yukon was the awareness of potential. Aboriginal Language Services, the department tasked with facilitating First Nations language efforts, was in search of rocks willing to lend their institutional expertise, I was able to write, or I wasn't afraid of writing, uh, to First Nations efforts. So in addition to my own heritage, the, the other situation that informs much of my thinking about this question is the Yukon Territory and the Aboriginal languages spoken there. And one of the interesting things about Casca is that it's a language that has more first language speakers than my heritage language, but it has a smaller overall population. Okay, so in the Yukon, institutions have been intimately involved, involved in the First Nations Aboriginal language efforts. Most prominent among them have been the now former Aboriginal Language Services, the Yukon Native Language Center, and the Department of Education, um, and to some extent the Yukon College. Each of these organizations has facilitated documentation, training, and development. Discursively, they have imagined a responsibility to these languages, and this responsibility has been made manifest through resource development, like language documentation, teacher training, grant writing, and institutional support, funding, personnel, project coordination. However, one of the goals has been program devolution, to transition management and responsibility for Aboriginal language projects from the government in the guise of Aboriginal language services to the First Nations. And this happened around 2008. So the future imagined by the government with respect to Aboriginal languages wasn't as much about how these languages will exist, but who will manage and control them, right? Who will run the project. And part of this management remains, so part, part of this management remains with the Yukon Native Language Center. Um, and then there's also the Department of Education. But one aspect that I'd like to highlight is that how materials, how futures materialize and get realized is very intimately embedded or connected to who controls that realization, right? That materialization. And then how that control gets distributed. So though the control of Aboriginal language efforts has seemed fairly centralized at times in the Yukon, it actually remains quite diversified across individuals and across institutions um, than other similar kinds of situations. Which is, uh, I'll talk about shortly here. <laughs> 
has allowed for the creation of all kinds of materials and new ideas and the piloting of new kinds of projects and ongoing development. Now, con in contrast, you could think about the Puebloan groups down in the southwest United States. And Tewa, for example, which is a Yiddo Aztec language spoken in Arizona and New Mexico. And here we have a case that's been talked about by Aaron Devonport and Paul Crossgreedy that sort of brings out the cons linguistically conservativeness of, of these groups. And in Devonport's case in particular, the tribe is so conservative, right? There's a small language community and that, or not community, a small language committee, and that committee controls everything. They decide what kinds of materials, how these materials will get produced, how they will get distri distributed and used, and there's very little room for any kind of deviation from their directives. In fact, it's a bit surprising, right, that even someone, an, an outsider, a non-First Nations person like Aaron Debrefort, was even allowed to participate and be involved. But the point is that the future of the Tewa language, right, will be determined by this select committee. A future focused on preserving the language, but only for a select few, so enrolled tribal members, and only in select ways, and in this case, primarily orally. This means that the centralization of control reinforces, in some ways, this shift from everyday use to a more specialized and esoteric practice. And this is, you know, this is one possible future. It's kind of like Latin in the Catholic Church. So, of course, taking a diversified approach, on the other hand, right, to saving a language also has challenges. There are cross-institutional tensions that arise in relation to what needs to be documented or how a language should be represented. We've had debates over how to write you. Should it have a bar over it? I think I've conceded. Fine. Bars. Great. <laughs> Sometimes, you know, people, especially people who understand the language but maybe they're not using it as productively as they might, uh, don't need most of these diacritics, right? The diacritics are there to help a lot of us uh, novice learners. Okay, so there can be tensions about how it should be represented, what should be taught, where and by whom, and in this case, how authority is managed and distributed can get murky. Right? and contestable. So rather than being too tightly constrained, as in the Tewa case, we get the opposite, sort of an explosion of possibilities and there's no potential future because there's no identifiable language per se. Well, in the Yukon, of course, there are languages and dialects to be saved, but the primary approach to saving them has been to institutionalize them, kind of, you know, along in fitting with the, the general institutional ideology and to store them in archives and to make them part of school curricula. So not everyone agreed or agrees with this approach. Uh, conceptually, differences have emerged within and across the institutions involved in Aboriginal language efforts in the Yukon. In terms of development, what should be done with the research and documentation of the languages, um, much of the basic research has resulted in teacher training and in text making. Um, certainly an important first step, right? that is the creation of an Aboriginal language curriculum for the public schools. And so in this image, so I'm not sure why I aligned it this way. Um, you have an image of the Casca Alpha book, which came out of a Casca language, House of Language workshop. And then you have an image from inside the alphabet book up here with the, the Luna. Um, and then the other diagonal are texts or um, kinds of lessons that would be used in the schools. And so if you look to the furthest where it says October lesson, even though this comes out of an adult language lesson book, um, basically the adult language lesson curriculum followed the same curriculum that was suggested uh, for the elementary and high school levels. Okay. So in 1998 and in 2008, this curriculum was fairly underspecified, meaning that the loose leaf binder that was the curriculum guide provided a generic template for lesson planning, but did not specify how to elaborate the lesson plan. It left that up to the teacher, and in this case, less was not more. And at the high school level, this has proven to be an even greater challenge, not just because the high school teacher speaks a different, though intelligible, dialect of Casca. So up until, what, it's like seventh grade, the kids are learning 
uh, from one teacher who speaks one dialect and then they go to the high school and they're exposed to a different dialect. But it's also a challenge because there's no standard curriculum. There's no elaborated curriculum that scaffolds learning. So the linguistic future for Casca that began to emerge as part of the school curr curriculum looked very nouny and very rote. It did not look like a functional future where the curriculum developed in keeping with the students' growing competence. Instead, it seemed to fossilize their linguistic knowledge so that students stopped learning Casca. And back then, as today, kids will tell you that they'll switch to French because it's a little more rigorous and they can do more with it and they learn more. We have a similar situation around our Ojibwe language program at the University of Michigan. Right? Students are switching to taking other things because when they compare it to the for other foreign language curriculum, it doesn't hold up. Okay, so we can imagine, or we could recommend developing immersion schools or programs, and there are immersion camps offered, but immersion requires buy-in from families and parents and institutions. It requires teachers, it requires resources, um, it requires space. Because of the diversity of the sociolinguistic landscape in the Yukon and the devolution of Aboriginal language services to First Nations, uh, though I should qualify this and say that are at different stages uh, in the land claims process, immersion has been more difficult to implement, right, to realize. So for ca the Casca First Nations, what has been realized is an expansion of use, if not necessarily an expansion of knowledge. So we have these fairly routinized ways of teaching Casca that seem like they are fossilizing knowledge, but at the same time, what you're starting to get is a kind of register differentiation. So you have young kids who know far more nouns than, say, some 20-something adults, um, but their verb knowledge, right? Their, their ability to produce verb, different verb forms is not quite on par with the adults. But the other thing you see, so I'm going to start by talking about, I guess, how people talk to kids. And so they're exposed to these different kinds of directives, like na, I didn't, right? You saw some of this in the earlier transcript. And they're learning this. They understand this. They can respond to this by sitting down, right? <laughs> by going and picking up a piece of paper. Um, in this next slide, you see the kinds of instructional statements that they're often exposed to in the classroom. And, and this is actually quite similar to some of the language socialization practices that you find uh, documented in research done in Papua New Guinea and Samoa. So you have, you know, parents, adults, elders directing them saying, say this, say that. And in response, you don't get kids saying, say, sini, right? Say, sini. They just say, assimly, <laughs> right? So there's, they understand, they're getting an understanding of the pragmatics. They may not be getting a full understanding of the grammatical complexity, right? But they are acquiring some knowledge of something. They are being socialized through these experiences. And then in this next slide, it's just a little bit of transcript, and you can see how it's playing out in use, and the kids are following this, and you can also see how in the variation between say X and then X at the, or X say, they're also starting to be exposed to the, the different syntactic organization of words. And then one last transcript, I think, think this is the last one. <laughs> in this last one, you see these same routines starting to be carried over into non-classroom contexts. So even though it might be a different style or register or variety of CASCA, it's still reinforcing and encouraging and getting kids to start to think about using it, even at very young ages, even if they're not being encouraged to, you know, express their opinions about language endangerment in CASCA. Okay, so these interactions demonstrate a few things. First, they demonstrate the structure of the style of routine used in the classroom. Second, this pattern suggests the creation of a register appropriate for addressing and using with children. Third, the last interaction shows the extension of the school routine into new contexts. So in this case, the routine is being used in the bush to elicit a response in Casca from the grandson. 
So while classrooms most certainly promote the use of a standardized style of speech, this standardized register often goes unnoticed in contexts where the students enter school already in command of the expected standard. However, in cases where there's no standard, the routines and language practices used in the classroom can become the standard register. In this case, the difference in speech form distinguishes speech addressed to children from speech addressed to adults. And this distinction then maps onto the social distinction that maps onto Aboriginal language expertise. So for some Kaska students, using the language in ways comparable to adults remained and remains a future enterprise and is perfectly part of how they imagine the future. For some younger children, it's become part of their pretend play, right? And yet for others, it allows engagement beyond the classroom. So speaking Casca in whatever guise it comes in offers an opportunity to build, transform, and project into the future imbued with all of this social significance of any living language. This calls for, then, an institutional and academic reorientation away from dichotomizations of first and second, or mother and foreign, or natural and instructed, or dominant and endangered, or maybe even English and other, right, in the US context, to evaluate linguistic environments in relation to idealized grammars, pronunciations, and registers maintains these dichotomizations in a trajectory of death for Aboriginal languages, whereas the emergence and recognition of new styles or registers of speech, regardless of their origins, anticipates a future. Okay, another way in which people are imagining a future for Aboriginal languages is through the new technologies available today um, that weren't available when I began working in Watson like over a, over a decade ago. The combination of cell phones and the internet allow for greater access to resources. A growing number of Aboriginal language communities are getting apps for their languages. So um, I worked with a graduate student who um, is Choctaw and they were developing apps. Um, Creek, I think, is developing an app. It's the wave of the future. You can already get apps for popular European languages. Language lessons for Navajo, Ojibwe, Lakota, and others are being posted on YouTube, so you can just go search and find short language lessons and you can learn sort of naming practices in Navajo. Even Twitter facilitates communication in Dene languages. So Leighton Peterson has been looking at how Navajo youth are using Twitter and how they correct each other with hashtags. The, I don't use Twitter. I, 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 <laughs> I could just sort of suggest that you go find out about this. <laughs> um, the question then is whether or not such new technologies can make a difference in an Aboriginal language's future. As with the texts of old, housed in archives and gathering dust, will people access these resources more than people have in the past? Or is is this just a new form of storage? Or will it actually increase accessibility, actually inspire more use and new user, uses and new users, right? Will it help encourage language growth and the realization of a future? Can an online talking dictionary accomplish something that a soft cover text could not? So I don't have answers to this question yet. <laughs> But you can see there's been a shift in just the last few years in working with Martina Volfo and with Patrick Moore, right? Creating Facebook pages where people are starting to post things, creating um, the UBC website where people can go and listen to recordings, practice their understanding and their pronunciation. And hopefully with the online talking dictionary, right, part of that project is to get people involved and get their feedback. To, to get them to help understand what's usable, what's interesting, how do you even organize? I mean, one of the biggest challenges with an Athabascan language is how do you organize the dictionary? In English, it's you know alphabetical by whatever the first letter is of some word, discrete word, not very morphologically complex, but with an Athabascan verb form, it's a whole other ball game. So one thing I would like to suggest that it, it will be different and it will be new and interesting and provide a new future because one of the striking differences between old technologies and new technologies, right, is in the style of interaction, in the engagement. 
there's a kind of response that happens through these uh, online media that you don't have with your standard text. All right, so there's the ability to hear the language as words, as stories, as conversation. There's the ability to be corrected, potentially. So I'm hopeful. OK, in the last few minutes, I just want to highlight a couple of other issues that arise that impact the future. But if we can rethink how, what an endangered language is, then perhaps these will not be as challenging as they have been. And one of them, going back to funding and institutions, are these targets that um, are imagined and idealized. Things like outcomes, deliverables, and broader impacts. Right, so a lot of funding organizations want something that can be distributed broadly. I mean, part of this also is the concept of open access, right? So the idea that everyone should be able to access these things, everyone should be able to learn. So this affects what they will fund. And so, for example, if what you want to have funded is how people speak, that doesn't, I'm not sure what kind of deliverable that would be. Um, or the broader impact beyond getting people to use the language within a community. The other dimension of this, which we're beginning to have conversations about, is intellectual property. So this kind of goes along with the open access concern, right? And there are some people like Justin Richland who have law degrees and know a lot more about this than <coughs> I probably ever will, right? Who are thinking about how you can go about protecting knowledge, how you, what some of the challenges will be in what you can post online and what you can't post online, how you can protect your own intellectual work. And so this is a growing issue with all of these new technologies and new ways of interacting online. So we have questions, right, about accessibility, rights, responsibilities, where and how do we locate control, who gets to be in control, how will data get managed into the future, new iterations, new platforms, right, what new threats might emerge. Okay. So, is language endangerment? So I had one last question I posed to my family. And that was, is language endangerment a 21st century issue or a 25th century issue? Is it something that should be at the forefront of our concerns? Certainly, when I began working with the CAST community, it was something that was of great concern, as you can see in these quotes, right? The effects of loss, are seen in the young people who are lost. Language is really important to maintain identity, but it's hard to do. Even my young nephew, right, was emphasizing the relationship between language and identity. Part of it is about well-being, right, and health. Um, and if you, it's also about moving into the future, right, preserving knowledge, but not just preserving knowledge, but carrying it forward and doing new things with it. So, in this last summary of my survey. My family emphasized that, well, it might be an issue for some, right? It's an issue that really should matter primarily to the communities whose languages are being impacted. I think I should all get them a Comanche dictionary for Christmas. <laughs> So they highlighted things, you know, like poverty, racism, clean water, if you know anything about what's going on in Flint, Michigan, um, healthcare issues, diabetes, politics, First Nations governance, all of these things were mentioned as being more important, more grave social issues except for one person. And she pointed out that these things are all interconnected. Right, that language, if we have language, 
then we can move forward, then we can heal, then we can make sense of all of these other, we can start dealing with these other issues. And one of the reasons this was part of her response is because she's in the middle of learning how to be a foster parent and dealing with foster care issues. And part of what the foster care system where she is emphasizes is connecting the child with their heritage, with their history, and with the future. And language is part of that. Okay, so to wrap up, that was, so six pe people said, no, not an issue, <laughs> not a real 21st century issue, and two people said it was. Okay, so wrapping up, if we were to ask the que question, will Casca survive? Will Comanche be carried into the future? I would say, Yes, indigenous Aboriginal languages can survive. As long as we recognize and allow for variation, right, complexity, that there are cycles of nurturing, that you, there will be different points in a person's life where they will be able to more fully participate in language revitalization than at other times. That collaboration is an important part of this. I don't know who was it said, you know, it takes a community, a village to raise a child, right? It takes a village and then some to raise a language. Uh, integration. So with, as with these social issues, it's, all, it's part of other kinds of practices and norms. And if we can recognize and build on that, right, then you can imagine a future. It requires thinking about practices beyond grammar, right? An expansion of practices and variability of practices and allowing and recognizing and letting those practices flourish. Uh, it requires a diversification of categories, right? So we need to move away from these kinds of dichotomizing uh, parallelisms and think beyond that. It also requires interaction with and through technology. I think this is probably one of the most exciting areas for thinking about futures. And then finally, and this I haven't talked about very much, the recognition of positive change. And in part, the recognition of positive change also requires feedback and evaluation. And for the most part, students, at least in these CASCO classes, are not getting any kind of feedback, right? There isn't some kind of recognition of progress of their development. And to bring that back into the picture might help these programs flourish and advance rather than stagnate and kind of fossilize. So in sum, right, with new perspectives, we can have with new perspectives come new futures. And so I don't know if you noticed in, when I started in the first slide, I had an image of the Oscar statue. Mm -hmm. So in this last slide, when we think beyond the 21st century, we can build off something Leonardo DiCaprio said. <laughs> or we should not take this planet for granted, and we should not take the future for granted, or the voices that it might have. Thank you.